Our first reading this morning is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, earnestness and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, Grace Kids. Today I have a great picture of runners behind me, and they are passing a baton to one another. And it's like a little stick, so it's a relay. And it really reminds me of the Bible passage for today, which comes from, from John chapter 3, verse 30 which says, he must become greater, I must become less. Okay, so in some races, there's a part where that runner passes that baton into the hand of the runner that's ahead of him, and that runner needs to run, 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 and carry that all the way over to the finish line. So the one who passed it off is done running, okay, but that one that's in front of him or her has a big job to do because they've got to make it to that finish line fast. Now, in the Bible, we learn about a time where Jesus uh, and his disciples were baptizing people nearby where John the Baptist and his disciples uh, were baptizing. And John the Baptist's disciples got a little bit upset because most of the people were going to where Jesus was instead of where they were. Now, do you think John the Baptist got upset about that? No, not at all. John the Baptist was actually filled with joy because John knew what his job was, which was to prepare the way for Jesus the Christ. And he knew that Jesus had a very important job to do. He knew who Jesus was. So John the Baptist said, he, meaning Jesus, must become greater. And I, meaning John the Baptist, must become less. So John, or just as John put himself last to Jesus, we need to do the same thing. Jesus needs to be in the spotlight. Jesus needs to have our attention and our focus for our lives needs to be on him first and foremost. So when the time came to sort of pass the baton to Jesus, John did so gladly. John's role was done. Now Jesus had the big work to do. Jesus was the only one who could do what he did, right? John wanted all the attention to be on Jesus. Jesus was the only one who could run to the finish line by giving up his life on the cross. And then the celebration happened on Easter morning where he rose from the grave so we could live with him forever. Boys and girls, we belong to Jesus. He's who we're living our lives for. Here are a few ways that we can see Jesus as greater in our lives and live our lives for him, okay? Number one, uh, when we learn about Jesus, we actually grow closer to him. 
He shows us when we pray, when we read the Bible, when we're here in church, that we belong to him. And second, Jesus becomes greater in our lives when we forgive and love others as we have been forgiven and loved. That's what he wants us to do. We're treating others the way he wants us to treat them. And you know what? His love shines so brightly when we live our lives for him. Now, belonging to Jesus and knowing that he's stronger than me, it makes me happy, just like it made John the Baptist happy, right? And so he said, he must become greater, I must become less. Let's say that together. He must become greater, I must become less. So spending time with him in prayer shows him how much we love him. So we're going to end this message by singing the song as our prayer. I think you know the song, Jesus Loves Me, but we're only going to sing the first verse. I have allergies going on, so I really need your help. So please sing with me. Here we go. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Amen. Well, Grace Kids, you were loved by a great big God. Let's remember that this week and share that message with others. Have a wonderful week. Bye. Um, I love that image of John passing the baton to Jesus, and then Jesus does something. He passes the baton back to the church, and we're all part of that. And so we have the baton, and he's calling us to, again, become less and Jesus be greater on the day that he comes back. It'll all make sense, right? For now, if you would stand as we read our gospel reading this morning, the verse that we're going to particularly cue out of is that what Serena has already mentioned, he must become greater and I must become less, but here's the context of that. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and the people were constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matters of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one that you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, a man can only receive what is given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify to that, I said. I am not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends to the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. You must, he must become greater, and I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all, and the one who is from heaven belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven, he is above all. He testified what he had seen and heard, but no one accepted his testimony. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. And the one whom God has sent speakers of the word of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything into his hands. Everyone who believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life, for the father's wrath remains on him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I'm going to invite you to be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you. It is good to see the people gathered here, God's people, and also those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live. Thank you for your presence. If you've been with us in the past month or so, you would know that we're kind of anchoring out of three words that we really believe would help define us as a body of believers. Um, 
And we're asking that the Holy Spirit would speak into us and shape us as we go about kind of understanding these key words. Um, we started the series by a couple of weeks on the idea of belonging. And then we talked about believing, and today we're going to kind of move into becoming. And those three words, you see them a lot around here. They're on our flags out there. They're on our logo. They're all over the place. And my hope and prayer is that after this six-week series, something would happen in your soul. And that would be that if somebody would come up to you and say, Hey, Doug, um, give me the elevator speech. What are those words all about? That you would have something to say that for 30 or 60 seconds you could say, you know what, here is what our church is about as we talk about belonging and believing and becoming. And I know that repetition is the mother of learning, and so I'm going to kind of retrack a little bit of the, the ground that we've trod and not spend too much time on it, but just for a second ask you to think with me, what does it mean to belong? Well, we talked about there's a sociological sense of belonging, you know, you're included in a group. There's a psychological sense, like where I feel like I fit with the group. But there is a declarative word that is far beyond any of that, and that's the word of God that says, I have called you by name, you are mine. Isaiah 43, 1 says, you belong. Not because you're such a great person, but because your God's love for you is so great that he's called us to belong. We live in an increasingly divided world, and people are longing to belong. There's all kinds of social media logarithms going on out there that feed us people who are just like us, and so our, our minds get settled in with those people, and we think anybody who thinks differently is outside of us. And, and Paul had words to say about that in Ephesians chapter 2. He talked about it. He said, don't let the dividing wall of hostility ruin the community that you have in Christ. See, some people today, and this is in our increasingly politicized world, would say, if you're from that party, you can't talk to somebody from that party. You know what? We're one in Christ. And some of you are going to believe this way, and some of you are going to believe that way. You know what? Don't let that dividing wall of hostility be the issue. These things are temporal. They will pass away. But there are things that are eternal. This is your family forever. Get along. <laughs> Figure it out, people. That's part of what he's saying to us as we belong. We don't belong to this thing that's divided. We belong to a common unity, a community that's cemented in communion, where we share the body and blood of Christ. We share something that is deeper than the issues of this world. Issues of race relationships, issues of support the police or Black Lives Matter, issues of all of these things. We have something that's bigger than all of those. It's Christ and his presence among us. We need that to belong. Secondly, we talked about what is it to believe? It's not just a cognitive head dump where we memorize lots of doctrines and spew out some things from catechism, but it's something that takes this 18 inches from head to heart and it integrates into our lives. It gets down in our guts. It gets all the way from the bottom of our toes to the top of our falling out hair, and it makes us alive. Belief makes us alive. We don't have to understand everything before we believe. First, we believe, and then God gives us understanding as we go, and we'll never understand everything. And so today, I want to talk to you a little bit about the word become. If you were to go on our website today, you would see a little picture that looks like that, and next to it, you would see some words that say this. It's a, it, they say, become. The Christian journey is a lifelong process. As we grow in get grace, he continues to refine us in surprising ways. Let me just ask you to pause on that for a second. Lifelong process and reform us and refine us in surprising ways. I don't know what you're expecting to hear today, um, but I would bet this, that you're going to hear some things that might surprise you a little bit, because I think that's how God's word works. It catches us a little bit off guard, and I hope that will happen for you today. I hope that he kind of rattles us from this place of comfort that we so easily get into to stretch us just enough that we do become more and more like him as we go along. 
A few weeks ago, I used an acrostic that we use in our fourth grade mentoring program. Um, it spells out the word leaders, and the word, or the D word in that leaders acrostic was developing, right? And I talked about how as we're lifelong learners, we're constantly developing, we're growing stronger. And I want to kind of pick up on that same idea today, that it is a lifelong process but that it comes to us in surprising ways. Here's one of the first surprises is sometimes when people hear that it's a lifelong process, they think this, they think, are you telling me that I'm not good enough and that I gotta get better before God will love me? And you know, I've been to enough hospital beds where people are dying and they would say, I hope I've done enough and they've been in church their whole lives. See, you can sit here and we can let that basic truth that God has done everything needful for your justification. You are right with him, not because of what you do, but because of what he has done. I want to free you from that burden today. No, you are not good enough. You never will be. Never will be. So do you have to get better? No. But will you get better as you are exposed to the grace of God in his word and in his love and through the sacraments? Yes. You know, if you're trying to get better, you're just wearing yourself and everybody else around you out. What you're really doing is you're becoming religious and moralistic. But when the gospel gets hold of you, you are transformed. It's not something you have to try to do. Yes, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. But I want to set you free from the sense that I have to be right with God by trying hard. That never works. It never works. You know, I've used this analogy before, but I think it's very appropriate as we talk about sanctification here a little bit today, because that's really the fancy church word for becoming. Sanctification. It means being made holy. What happens in order to make us holy is it starts with the gospel. And I, I used to think, you know, I was over here on this side of the divide, and God was over here, right? And the cross is the bridge that makes me able to connect to God. And that's a good analogy. That's a good way to think about it. And so if you follow that analogy out a little bit more logically, you say, you know, is if I'm in Bible study, and if I'm in church, and if I'm in a life group, and if I'm in prayer regularly, and I do daily devotions and all of that stuff, I get a little bit closer to God every day. And so the gap between God and I gets smaller. Does that make sense? Ah, trick question. <laughs> I hope you say no. Because that's been my realization. That actually what happens, the more I know about Doug, and the more I know about God, it's more like Doug is in Siberia and God is in Miami, Florida. That's the distance between us. It's not this little distance right here. And the role of the cross grows and expands in our life the more we become. The more we are sanctified, the more we are made holy, the more we realize how holy we aren't and how distant from him we are. I want you to know that I really buy into what 1 Corinthians 1.23 says, they, basically that Christ crucified is the whole enchilada. I'm paraphrasing there. But Christ crucified is the main thing. That's what makes us right with God, period. But there is this business about sanctification, this whole being made holy as we go. And is that what makes us right with God? No, 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 no. But I do want to explore that idea today a little bit with you. There's a guy named uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen, who actually, I like his little quotes that I found of him. Here's one that he had that I thought was very cute. He said, hearing the confession of nuns is like being stoned to death with a bag of popcorn. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. Has nothing to do with sanctification, but it makes him real to me, right? He's a real guy, and he was kind of a famous Catholic theologian, but listen to what he says here about sanctification. He says this, curiously enough, it is a fear of how grace will change and improve things that keeps many souls away from God. Think about that. Fear of how grace will change and improve things that keeps many souls away from God. They want God to take them as they are and let them stay as they are. 
They want him to take away love of riches, but not their riches. He wants to purge them, uh, he, to, he wants to purge them of their disgust of sin, but not the pleasure of sin. Some of them equate goodness with indifference and evil and think that God is good if he is broad-minded and tolerant about all evil. Like the onlookers at the cross, they want God on their terms. They shout, come down here and then we will believe. But the things they are asked are marks, but the things they are asking are marks of a false religion. The promise of uh, salvation without the cross, abandonment without sacrifice, Christ without nails. God is a consuming fire. Our desire for God must include a willingness to have the chaff burned away from our intellect and the weeds of our sinful will purged. In other words, God's going to mess with you a little bit. That's what he's saying. God is not going to allow you to stay exactly the same and just kind of relax and say, chill pill, I got this God thing. I just show up on Sundays, throw a few bucks in the plate. That's religiosity. And a live relationship with God means that he's churning on you and he's taking out from you and he's doing things in you beyond what you can understand. Sometimes it's better to consult some children's books on these matters than great theologians. Let me discuss with you, or let me um, bring to you one of the uh, Chronicles of Narnia. This is the third book in the C.S. Lewis series, and it's called The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Listen to this opening paragraph. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved that name. His uh, parents called him Eustace Clarence, and his classmates called him Scrub. I can't tell you what his, his friends said his name was, because he had none. Whoa. Now listen to this further explanation of why he had no friends. See, Eustace Clarence disliked people, especially his cousins, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. But he was quite glad to hear that Edmund and Lucy were coming to stay at his house. For deep down inside, he liked bossing and bullying. And even though he was a puny little kid and couldn't even stand up to Lucy, let alone Edmund, in a fight, he knew that there were dozens of ways to give people a bad time if you are on your own turf and they are only visitors. Eustace Clarence Scrub had a hard heart. He didn't have any friends. None at all. And as the story goes along, he becomes insufferable. And about page 90, we see a turning point where Eustace is turned into a dragon. And while he is in this state of being a dragon, and re he realizes that he has devolved into something quite base, quite greedy, quite dragonish in heart. And he doesn't even realize he's a dragon at first. But once he does, he embraces the truth of his own brokenness. And he realizes that the others weren't the problem, that he is the problem. And he says this, those others weren't the fiend at all. He had simply been blaming all of his troubles on the other. Eustace isn't immediately transformed. He realizes he's monstrous. His character starts to improve. And he becomes anxious to help out the other kids, and on cold nights they even leaned into Eustace, who was once the coldest of all, and now they find warmth in him. See, what he realized is he was a dragon all along, that his heart had dragonish, selfish, greedy tendencies. Now here's the part you might not like. You and I are dragons. I'm the problem. COVID-19 is not the problem. Racial tensions aren't the problem. Politics aren't the problem. Your boss isn't the problem. Your spouse isn't the problem. Your kids aren't the problem. 
Doug's the problem. And you and I are in good company. The good news is this. Page 93 comes along, and it says, It would be nice and fairly true to say that from that time forth, Eustace was a very different boy. To be strictly accurate, he began to become a different boy. He had relapses. There were still very many days when he could become quite tiresome. But most of those we shall not notice. The cure had begun. You and I are the problem. The good news is this. The cure has begun. The cure has begun. When you are a baptized believer in Christ, you are made new. The old has passed away, the new has come, and God is constantly helping us to become, sanctifying us along the way, changing who we are at the very core. It's really an interesting thing, the very last page of this book, and I'd encourage you to read it. If you've ever read the Chronicles of Narnia, um, they're quite delightful. The very last paragraph of the book says this. Everyone soon started saying how Eustace had changed and improved and how you've never, you'd never know that he was the same boy. That's a pretty radical difference. You'd never know that he was the same boy. Don't you want that to be said about you and I? that you would never know from where they started to where they've come to, the power of God is transforming them and making them into something they weren't. I know I want that. And I hope you want that. I'm the problem. It starts there, the self-realization that the problems aren't all out there. Quit blaming everybody else and take a look inside here. Luther said it this way in a sermon on Matthew chapter 27 in the year 1540. He said this, what then shall we do with the sin that remains in us after we have come to justifying faith? The Holy Spirit says through St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, he said, sweep out the sin, but sweeping continues until the grave. Sweep out the sin, but sweeping continues until the grave. The forgiveness of sins takes only a moment. When we accept the word of God by faith, but the sweeping continues until we see him face to face. God transformed Eustace by helping him realize that he was broken and that his heart was cold and dragonish. Aslan came alongside of Eustace and gave him a whole new warmth that he wouldn't have had in any other way. And when we are truly broken in that kind of a way where we realize we have a dragon heart, God does something amazing in us. He continues to sweep out the old sin until the day we get to see him face to face. This is what John was saying. John chapter 3, verse 30. I must become less and he must become greater. See, People don't need what you and I have. They need what Jesus can offer. They need what arms extended from Siberia to Miami can offer. <laughs> One who realizes they, they fall so far short of the glory of God and who are being transformed by him. What's our job? Our job is to pass the baton on until the next leg of the journey, which is when Jesus comes again. John passed the baton to Jesus. Jesus passed it to the early church. The early church passed it on to us. And today we get to keep passing on the baton, like Serena was saying. And this is the surprising thing. I mentioned God changes us in surprising ways. He sanctifies us in surprising ways. How are you going to know, my question is this, how are you going to know that you are becoming one who is more warm, who is, the dragon heart is dissipating and the Jesus heart is beating faster. How are you going to know? 
How are you going to know if Galatians 5, 22 and 23 are coming alive in you? Remember the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. How are you going to know if those are really activating in your life? Well, it's a dangerous question, but I'd say ask the people closest to you. (laughs) Now, at this point, many people are listening with their elbows, right? Oh, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. No, I'm talking to you. See, the people closest to you, God's intentionally put them there because they know you intimately. They know who you are at the core. Your friends, your family, your coworkers, the people who know you. And if you would be bold enough to ask them that question, am I becoming more peaceful, more kind, more gentle, more loving, more self-controlled? They'll probably be honest with you. Then your job is to listen. And everything you hear is not going to be pretty. Some of it's going to be hard to hear. But that's how God works. He's shaping us through the power of people and through the power of his word. There's an alternative to that, to becoming more like him, and it looks like this. Becoming more critical, becoming more nitpicky, becoming more grumbly, becoming more judgmental, becoming more whiny, becoming more contemptuous, becoming more rigid, becoming more religious, becoming more of a meanie pants. (laughs) That's the alternative. Which would you rather be? Who do you want to become? God's Spirit today is humbling each of us and calling each of us to become like Jesus. It's an interesting thing. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, whoever wants to be great, he must be your servant. That's where we're going to pick up next week. This surprising business of becoming First, it looks inside and says, yeah, I got a dragon heart. Yeah, I got a lot of stuff that needs to be swept out. And it just starts there, just being real. And then God inspires us, gives us things to aspire to be. Faithful, loving, hopeful, joyful, patient, self-controlled. Those are my prayers for you, my friends, and my prayer for me is that God continues to help us to become all that we can in light of his spirit. I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. Father, uh, these are kind of hard words to hear because they're challenging. I'm the problem? Yep. Help us to realize um, we can't control anybody but us. Shape us and mold us and make our hearts like yours. Help us to be transformed into the image of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the cross that makes us right with you, that justifies us. And we thank you that your spirit comes alongside of us and makes us holy, sanctifies us, turns us more and more into the image of you. Not that we're now somehow, the gap has shrunk. No, no. But somehow, miraculously, you allow us to carry the baton. You allow us to carry the good news, to be image bearers to those around us. Lord, thank you for this great privilege. May we become even more bold in our witness that uh, our, our love for the community would be even stronger and that you would build in us a common unity that maybe only exists on the surface today. We ask it for Jesus' sake and all God's people said, amen. You know, the Bible reveals lots of things about God to us, some of the things we just talked about, but some are about his very nature. Who is he, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? So I'm going to ask you, if you would, now to stand and boldly proclaim with me, if these are your beliefs, um, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.